Welcome to the Digital Marketing Victories Podcast, a podcast about the realities of digital marketing. Listen in each month to learn about the tactics and strategies, soft skills, and technical requirements that go into digital marketing success. I'm Catherine watsier Ong, owner of WO Strategies LLC, an organic traffic consultancy. And I'm Jim Keeney, owner of Federal Web Consulting and founder of DAP, the platform for the engagement economy. Welcome. Let's get into it and celebrate our victories. For this month's podcast, we are excited to interview Kathleen Slattery Booth, host of the Inbound Success Podcast and VP of Marketing at Attila Security. If you are a startup and tackling digital marketing for the first time, this is a great podcast for you. Kathleen covers many of the core topics you need to be successful as you start and build your digital marketing. From finding your voice to the mechanics of setting up a repeatable marketing process, this podcast covers it all. Kathleen has a wealth of expertise, having run her own digital agency for 11 years, Quinte Marketing, and now with hands-on experience ramping up the digital marketing for Attila Security. And by the way, she even explains the origin of the name Quintain. So enjoy. Hello, we're so glad to have you on the podcast today. Um, so Kathleen, why don't you give us a little background about yourself to get started? Sure. My name is Kathleen Booth, and I am VP of Marketing at a company called Attila Security, which is in the cybersecurity space. Um, I have been in marketing for longer than I would like to admit. Uh, I owned a digital marketing agency for 11 years um, that we worked with companies all over the country to put together um, digital marketing strategies and help them execute. And then uh, since exiting that, I've spent about two years in-house coming in as the first head of marketing for um, early stage high growth companies. So that's me in a nutshell. I'm, oh, I should mention, I'm also the host of a podcast called the Inbound Success Podcast, where we talk a lot about inbound and digital marketing. Awesome. So I'm always very curious about how people got their start in digital marketing, because most of us come from some other background. I'm assuming your background was marketing before you got the digital bug? Sort of. So I did study marketing. Um, I have an MBA in it, but I spent the first 10 years of my career working in international development, actually. So I've had a really strange and circuitous career path, but um, actually it was through international development that I really, that, that it led me back to marketing because I worked on a lot of really big public sector reform projects and started seeing a pattern that the projects would stall because of poor communication and lack of support. And I began using my marketing skills to really teach public uh, sector officials how to strategically communicate earlier in the process so that they could build a groundswell of support so these projects would move forward. So that really led me back to marketing and when I wanted to start a family and have kids and couldn't travel all over the world for my international development work anymore, that, that's kind of when I started an agency. So, And that explains the name of your agencies, right? <laughs> so Quintain, uh, coming from your family name, and then later on you worked at Impact. So actually, Quintain, this is this is a common misnomer. There oh, is okay. no family connection. That oh, was okay. so. My company was Quintain Marketing, and my husband and I were starting this company and sitting around and thinking, well, we've got to open a bank account. We've got to get this going, but we didn't have a name. And so we sat down one night with a bottle of wine and said, we're not going to sleep until we have a name. And got out, you know, thesaurus.com and started Googling things. And, and funny enough, a, a Quintain is a type of target. And we wow. had been having these conversations about like targeted marketing, but that's so overused and cliched. And, and Quintain was interesting. We saw it. It was a synonym. It is actually a target used to teach a knight how to joust. And what I loved about it was that, it, you know, the knight hits the, the Quintain, but it's on a Uh, an arm that swings around and there's a weighted ballast on the other side. And if he doesn't hit it just right, the weighted ballast swings around and knocks him off the horse. And I loved that because I was like, it's really easy to get a message to a target or an audience, but there are so many ways that, that, that could go wrong. So it's not just about reaching your audience, it's about reaching them in the right way. And then of course it helps that, you know, there, Maryland where we were based has the Renaissance Festival and jousting is the state sport. So I was That's like, right. oh. and we could get the domain name. <laughs> jousting is a state sport. I never knew that. That's amazing. <laughs> Growing up, I always thought it was lacrosse until somebody corrected me and said, no, it's jousting. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So. so in your current position, because this podcast is all about um, the persuasion and the nuts and bolts that go into the digital marketing bit, 
So in your current position, what's the biggest challenge that you faced in relation to persuasion, in relation to pushing through your digital marketing strategies? You know, I'm very fortunate in my current position that I work for a CEO and a, and a team of leaders that when they hired me, made the commitment that, hey, you're the expert, we're going to trust you, you do what you need to do to be successful. So I, I will say that I haven't had to do a whole lot of persuading in my current position, but I have been in many roles where I have. And so what I would say is that number one, it is important when you're coming into a marketing role to look at you know, who the leadership of the company is and, and are they bought in to digital? Because, you know, you have to have your eyes open. I'm not saying you shouldn't take a role where, where there isn't that buy-in, but you have to go in knowing that it's going to be a much steeper hill to climb. Um, what has worked for me really well is connecting my efforts with revenue and not, not measuring success on the number of leads I've generated, but measuring success on, you know, the pipeline value that, that I've contributed to. And, and also really coming in from the outset with a mindset of, of my most important customer is the sales team, because they're obviously the ones who are going to make me successful in generating revenue. And if I can build a really great relationship with sales, and if, if that relationship leads to closed one deals, that goes a very long way. And, and then the only corollary to that, I think, is, is just aggressively communicating internally. You know, as marketers, we so often think about how are we going to communicate externally and what's our campaign for our potential customers. But internally, you have a lot of customers as well. You know, the, the leadership of the company, the sales team, the folks that you're going to rely on to create content, you need to look at them as another customer set. Can we dive into that a little bit deeper? And can you kind of go into what are the various different pieces that make a good marketing system? Because that's one of the things that I think you do very, very well as you think about it as a systematic approach, you know, how to get the, get the message out there, but then what happens after the message, you know, after the leads start coming in and how they flow through? Yeah. You know, I'm a big believer in if you're going to invest your time and money in marketing, because it is an investment, you should be building an engine that is repeatable and scalable. Um, and to the extent possible, putting that time and money into things that are going to really pay off over the long term. And I've always likened it to the difference between renting a house and buying a house. You know, when you rent a house, as soon as you stop paying rent, you know, the, the clock starts ticking and you're, you're eventually going to be evicted, right? Whereas if you buy your house and you own it and you're putting that, that investment in, that's going to pay off for you at some point. So with marketing, what I look at is what do we, first of all, what do we really want to be known for? I think a problem that a lot of companies have is they don't message well, or they, they try to be all things to all people, especially at early stages, which is when I tend to come in, there's a lot of chasing dollars, no matter where they're coming from. And that can lead to, I think, confusion from the outside as to what the company really does or what it sells and how it's differentiated. So the first thing I do, and it's what I'm working on now, because I'm only a month into my current position is getting, getting the team to focus. What are the, what, what's the number one thing we want to be known for? That's first. And then under that umbrella, you know, let's pick two or three things to really put our effort into. And let's be very conscious about agreeing what we're going to say no to. Um, and, and that's the conversation I've been having internally at my current company. You know, I put together a 90 day marketing plan because I'm a big believer that you really can't plan out further than 90 days in most cases because the world changes so quickly. And if you're doing your job well as a marketer, it's going to change quickly because you're getting a lot of results. And that, that means that you're going to need to reevaluate based on those results. So I have a 90 day plan. In that plan for me, I have three very concrete focus areas that I'm working with the sales team and the leadership team to align around. And the conversations I'm having are along the lines of, we're going to say no if it's not in these three areas. Um, okay. So staying focused and making sure you can say no, that's important. Once you have that in place, then really understanding how to build out a funnel. And in marketing terms, we talk about top, middle, and bottom of the funnel. Right. And at the top of the funnel, it's all about content creation. And again, staying focused on those three areas. So 
lots of people blog and create content, but they're all over the place. And when you're all over the place, Google doesn't know what it, what it should consider you an expert in. So um, I like to create content strategies that go really deep on my three focus areas so that Google can clearly see, hey, we know more about this than anybody else on the internet. Um, right. So creating that top of the funnel to pull people in organically, but at the same time, making sure that the content we're creating serves the sales team because the fastest path to revenue is arming the sales team with content that's going to help them close deals more quickly. Um, so that top of the funnel and then at the middle of the funnel, um, really putting together great customer stories, case studies, things like that, that show um, how your solution has an impact and also highlighting your, your subject matter experts. I strongly believe that today, because there's such a glut of content on the market, the best way to stand out is to lead with the personal brands of the subject matter experts on your team. Um, so, you know, when you post blogs, don't have them come, don't have the author listed as your company, you know, right. have it listed as a person in the company. Um, if you do a newsletter, don't have it come from info at, have it come from your CEO or some other highly visible person and put some personality into the content you're creating. Um, if you build out content assets at those different levels of the funnel, then you have all the, the individual pieces you need to, to nurture someone. And so having those building blocks is important. And then once you have them, there are plenty of tools out there that can help you go faster, you know, automation platforms, et cetera. Right. So the uh, kind of emphasis on subject matter experts and their reach, is that in part driven by the organic reach of LinkedIn nowadays? I think, I think right now LinkedIn is, has a ton of value. I'm, there are lots of platforms and there are lots of different ways to get that reach. Um, the thing that's so critical, even before you can think about platforms, is authenticity. You know, the, the way to really build a powerful personal brand is by having something to say that somebody can't find somewhere else. Got so it. it's not just creating, you know, checking the box and creating content and listing your CEO as the author. It's what is this person contributing to the broader conversation about the topic that people can't find somewhere else. That's what's going to get people to continue coming back to you. So if you can, and a lot of companies are afraid of that because it means having a point of view, which can be controversial. Um, but if you, can, if you can get that kind of content created that stands for something that has a point of view, then there are plenty of channels and it really depends on your audience. I like LinkedIn. I also love Twitter. Um, at one of my previous companies, we got a lot of great results from Facebook. I've seen people get great results from Medium. I think the channel is less important as the content itself. And then of course, understanding your audience and, and where they're gonna be most likely to engage with it. Well, and certainly critical from an SEO perspective to have something unique. John Mueller is always saying like you, the reason that you would rank is because you have something better than what's currently already out there. And That's so, right. you know, better is more, one of the ways to get to better is more unique. Definitely. Yeah. And, and I would actually add to that and say, if you have to make a choice between creating a higher volume of content or creating higher quality content, Oh, go for quality every single time. Um, because if you had one amazing, really long form, in-depth piece of content on the thing that you're most interested in getting found for, that is so much better than, you know, 50 okay right. blog articles that check the box. <laughs> yeah. So in, in its early days with your new uh, company and position, and and you're dealing with kind of startup issues. Your subject matter experts, I'm assuming, are the people who work in the company at this stage. Can you walk us through the the process since you've been since you've worked with companies at all levels? Um, how would you take that early days content generation and and evolve it over time? Because you know one of the biggest things that you struggle with with startups is the president, CEO, the founder. They're completely swamped with everything they have to do. They love to create content, but they never seem to get to it. How do you get past that so that you're generating things on a more systematic basis? Oh, well, I would say some of them love to create content. Not all of them. <laughs> um, uh, I, across the board, have found in every single case that the only way to really make it work is to not ask them to create the content themselves. 
but to have somebody interview them and record that interview and work with a writer who is able to, to essentially ghostwrite something for them. So it's still really them creating content, but you're not asking them to sit down and write, you know, that's time consuming and it's just not realistic, especially at a small, well, at any company where the leader is busy. So, um, I, I like to try and find people who are really good questioners to do those interviews. Sometimes I'll do them myself. Uh, sometimes I will, if you have a, like a marketing manager who's really good at it or who's been trained in it, they can do it. But my favorite thing is to hire uh, people who have journalism backgrounds to act as content managers because they're trained to do this. This is what they went to school for and they know how to ask the right questions and how to take that and turn it into a great piece of content. Now, considering you have a podcast, are you then recording that content in a way in which you can use it on different mediums? So are you videotaping that? So it could be a video asset plus an audio asset plus written. Oh, so I was wondering, since you run a podcast, when you record the senior leadership, are you doing it in such a way where you can get different mediums of, out of that same interview? So video plus audio plus written. I mean, in a perfect world, yes. So I love video. It's awesome. It, it's easy. People, for some people, it's, they're so much more comfortable speaking than they are writing. So yeah, in a perfect world, I would love to, to have a camera rolling, do that interview, you know, write up a, an article from it, turn it into a podcast and also, you know, use some of the video and create different video snippets. If you can do that, that's, that's the best of all worlds for number one, because you get more, you know, you squeeze more juice out of the orange for yourself from a content standpoint, but also for your audience, you know, everybody likes to consume content and learn in different ways. And it's so great if you can say, Hey, you want to learn about this topic? I'm giving you three options. You can listen to it. You can watch it, or you can read it. So getting back to your podcast, I'm kind of curious what are the trends that you've seen across your guests? Are there any interesting insights that you've gotten by interviewing the folks on your podcast, particularly related to either getting closer to your customer or persuading people as you're launching a digital marketing campaign? You know, I've interviewed a lot of people and what they all have in common is they're all getting great results. And it's been really interesting. I would say the number one takeaway I have uh, is that they're consistent and they just do it right on a regular basis. It's like exercise. Uh, I think a lot of marketers know exactly what they should do. Just like a lot of people know, you know, they should be exercising all the time, but we just don't do it. And the best marketers are like driven to be super consistent. Um, when it comes to things like persuading people and understanding the customer, for sure, they're passionate about talking with the customers themselves. So whether that means you know, going out and meeting with customers. I've talked to, I think it was like uh, Baron Caster at rev.com who talked about how he set a goal for everybody on his marketing team that they had to talk to a certain number of customers per month. And then they'd have a meeting and come back and everybody would report back. Um, it could be that, it could be uh, listening to recorded sales calls. You know, there's a, it could be another co person I talked to had a, an automatic trigger set so that when they closed a new customer within that first month, he would reach out and talk to every single new customer. You know, I think it depends on your business and the volume you're experiencing, but just having that passion for firsthand as a marketer, talking to the customers, not relying on assumptions and, and listening really closely, not just to what they're saying, but the words they're using when they say it, because marketers are like really, really guilty of real using jargon and assuming we know what people want. And I think the best ones throw that all out the window and, and listen deeply. That's excellent. Um, that is kind of one of the critical points in this all um, is, is it's not just what the customer says back to you and how that allows you to kind of form your um, solutions and, and products and things like that. But it's also the language that they use to describe it becomes that kind of fundamental piece of your marketing that emotionally resonates. Because one of the things, as you said, jargon, it, it's not always jargon. People are very well-meaning. So especially with new startup, they, they understand the product that they're producing. They understand the problem that they're solving. What they don't understand a lot of times is how the customer themselves describes that. 
and the language that they use and the and the emotional triggers that that revolve around that so that process that you described of reaching out to the customers i think that that's kind of a critical piece of this right yeah and a great question to ask by the way the one that I, is sort of my go-to is if you had never heard of us or our product or our service or whatever it is we're selling didn't know we existed and you needed to solve the problem that that you came to us to help solve what question would you type into google because oh, wow. a lot of times yeah. we get wrapped up in in like how they're searching for us but but if you assume that you never existed it, it forces them to think like what's the generic way i would i would search for this and those are the terms that you really want to be using yeah, I'm, I'm passionate about uh, customer discovery in the lean startup process. And um, the fundamental thing that I always have to teach people in the first place is imagine that you don't have any information about your product before you start talking to the customer. Yeah. And, and it's very hard to get people off of that. You know, you, you have to tell them, okay, talk to them about what's going on right now, have them tell you what's going on right now, and then worry about whether or not that actually turns into a product. And, and I think the advice that you're giving right now is very much in that school of, you know, how, how do we, you know, how do we have conversations with customers where the customers are actually telling you how they look at the world so that when you then turn around and market back to them, you're reflecting exactly the way they think. That's right. Yeah, I had some great success using um, user testing back in the day where we did a focus group with the target demo, but they didn't necessarily know the product. And we gave them a problem, a scenario without using a keyword, and then ha actually watched them go to their phones and start searching. Completely eye-opening. They were using keywords I never would have guessed. And then, of course, you get to see all the Google personalization, which I think is really shocking for a lot of people, even though it's yeah. been going on for a very long time. Um, but it's it was great intel to hand back to the client about keywords and what sites they sh they're competing against for the topic and that kind of thing. Yeah, it was a great test. I love to do it with when whatever client I can for sure. Yeah, it's fascinating. And coming back to so so. Um, we've talked about generating that content in the first place and, and the way you described it, you're, that content is top of funnel, bottom of funnel, and middle of funnel. Um, especially when you're kind of diving into the, into the uh, subject matter experts, that's middle and bottom potentially. Let's talk about how that turns into a repeatable system. So you talked about the fact that marketers that are good, and this is a thread, are passionate about getting it done. What are the things that you found within organizations that you use to kind of reinforce that it's just a process, keep going? Well, again, it goes back to internal communication. And I think I don't always, I know when it comes to internal communication, I think I could even do a better job for sure. Um, I feel like the gold standard is, you know, on a weekly basis, send out an update to the whole company about where things stand with marketing but also um, a, a very accomplished marketer who I interviewed talks about showing your work. And I love this. You know, if you have, for example, Slack internally, do you just Slack out, hey, here's a landing page we just built. Here's a new campaign we just launched. Like those frequent communications, don't wait for there to be like a big report uh, right. to the board or an all hands meeting, like those frequent wins in between, I think are so important. And because so much of what we do as marketing happens behind the scenes. And right. I think it can leave a lot of people wondering what the heck we're doing. So the more you can share those little things, I think the better it, you'll, you'll be able to build support and get people to have the forbearance to stick with it for a longer term. Oh, and I should also mention with content that we did this at one of the companies I was at last year, and I'll be putting it in place where I am now on a weekly basis, sharing the articles that are performing really well and uh, kind of giving a shout out to the authors. So, you know, Hey, Joe contributed to this blog we wrote that really got a lot of traffic last week. I think that makes people feel like, okay, that hour I spent being interviewed or that time I spent writing, that was really worth it because people are seeing it. And your sales department is an internal customer in the same way. So can you talk about how, do you do anything different to kind of emphasize the communication with the sales group and to get feedback from the sales group uh, as you launch various different pieces of content and, and marketing campaigns and initiatives? 
Yeah. My first thing is to just meet with the sales team and tell them that they're my most important client. And then to have a recurring meeting with them on a regular basis. That is really about how I can help them. That's number one. Number two, then the sales team, it can really help marketing also because they're on the front lines. They're hearing the questions that prospects are asking and every single question they get should really go into your editorial calendar. Because if one person is asking it in person, there's probably 10, if not a hundred or a thousand people asking it online. And even if that's not happening, if you can create a written piece of content to answer that question, arm the sales team with that, that's just more sales enablement to help them close deals. So getting those questions from the sales team, I like to personally, I'm a fan of Slack. I like to have a Slack channel where they can just drop them in as they hear them, or if they want to forward them to me by email. Um, making it as easy as possible for them to provide that feedback is super, super important. And then once content has been created, I like to create a sales content directory. So, you know, if you have any kind of a wiki, for example, we use uh, SharePoint, but I've, I've used Atlassian products in the past. Whatever you're using, if you can create some kind of a wiki of, look, here are links to blogs we've written that are really, really valuable from a sales enablement standpoint. So if you're writing an email as a salesperson after a sales call or following up on something and you need a really quick reference point of, hey, here's some great content to draw from, making that easy to find instead of forcing them to scroll through your whole blog, I think is really helpful. That's excellent. You know, that kind of closes the loop. It brings that back in. When you then circle back with your marketing team, talk to me about uh, how that conversation goes when you're kind of reviewing the questions that come back in from the sales team, things of that nature. Yeah. um, You know, we'll go through them and try to prioritize based on which ones we think, you know, show high buying intent. So for example, like a lot of times questions revolve around cost or comparisons, like why should I buy from you versus your competitor? Those kinds of topics are generally for me, super high priority for a couple reasons. Uh, one, they're, those are big things that people Google, cost questions versus questions, things like that are really, really hot. They have high search volume. So if you can create content around it, you're more likely to rank, but also the people that are going to respond to that kind of content generally have a high buying intent. You know, the fact that they're looking for that kind of information signals that they're pretty deep into the buying process. So those are the best types of leads to pull in and also the best kind of information to provide the sales team. So really looking through those questions and trying to sort the ones that relate back to high buying intent and would also have a high search volume and prioritizing those first. So do you find that when you publish that on your own site, it performs better or depending on the industry, it performs better if you get it published to one of the product comparison sites? I'd like to do both, (laughs) Uh, but not use the exact same content, obviously. This gets into deeper SEO issues of like who essentially is the canonical URL. Anyway, I would like to have it on both. I think you, if you, if you're, for example, selling a software product, you should have that kind of information on your listing on sites like G2 and Captera and Trust Radius. Um, if there are other specific sites, you know, if you're maybe in a different space, but there are review sites for that, you, you've got to have a presence on those sites. But I think it's really great to have it on your website because ultimately, if somebody is searching your product versus something else, if you can get them to read that article on your site, it gets them to your site right now. The, the one thing about it is it has to be, cannot be written to seem biased. You know, somebody's going to know right. you're writing it. And so you have to immediately start out by acknowledging like, look, we sell this product, but we're trying to provide an unbiased viewpoint. And, and there are a lot of ways to do that. Like, and we can go deep on that if we wanted to, you know, with versus topics, you can actually pull from review sites and say, this is what the review sites say, but making sure your content is, is written in an unbiased fashion is really, really important. It seems like the place where strategy meets tactics is through your content calendar. 
or your uh, marketing calendar. Um, talk to me about how you kind of institutionalize that and work through that. So you, you talked about, you know, you can't see beyond 90 days, but having, having a calendar for that 90 days can really help people stay focused, stay sharp on which topics are most important. And also it drives, you know, it drives internal behavior. So um, can you kind of unpack how you utilize that? Yeah, so I am a, a big devotee of what's called the uh, pillar content and topic cluster yep. approach. And essentially what that means is when you, for example, in my case, I have those three focus areas. I will be creating what's called a piece of pillar content for each of those three focus areas. And, and put in very simple terms, what pillar content is, is it is a in-depth piece of content that is designed to be the best source of information on that topic on the internet. Kind of goes back to what you said about John Mueller earlier. It, and I think it's, um, Brian Dean calls it the, the skyscraper strategy. You know, you, you need to be the best source of content. So if you're going to create a piece of pillar content on something, you start by Googling that topic and seeing who comes up number one. And your first thing is you've got to create something better than that, but really going in depth. And the beautiful thing about pillar content is you can add to it over time. So it doesn't have to be like, boom, I created it and I'm finished. It can be, I just created this amazing piece of content and I'm going to continue updating it and adding to it and making it more robust so that I stay ahead and make sure that I'm continuously having the best piece of information. And then once you've built that, you build what's called your topic cluster, which is all kinds of supporting articles and web pages around that topic that go into detail on some of the more niche aspects of it. And there are technical aspects of this too, where you want to have your articles linked back to the pillar and the pillar linked to the articles. All of that is the, the technical plumbing that tells Google we are the world's best expert on this topic. When it sends its SEO spiders out to crawl your site, those links um, and the way you, you build your, your content are, send the signal that it is authoritative. So I'm kind of curious because I know that Google has been spending a bit more time looking at authority. So expertise, authority, and trust, particularly in certain industries. And you had been talking about how you are leveraging employees and their personal brand. So um, are, is one of the things I notice with a lot of my clients that they either don't have author bios or they're pretty thin. Uh, and then whoever they've got talking on behalf of the company might not have the most robust online presence, perhaps. So do you spend a bit of time sort of improving both of those kind of consistently? As you're talking about like a systematic process, I'm just wondering in the back of my head, that's kind of one that I pull up all the time for every single yeah. client. Absolutely. Amen to that. So when I, uh, in the last few positions I've come into, I've, uh, one of the first things I've done is redesign the website. And as part of that, I build into the scope of work for the team doing the website that I want the author bio to actually be the same as the person's page in the team section of the website. So I'm a big believer that you go to your, you know, the about us page and you, you have a section on that page or a, even a page in and of itself that's about your team. And it's not just pictures and links to their LinkedIn, which is something that my current company has, but we're working on changing. You, you actually link to a page just about that person. And for me, the best practice is that page has that person's bio. Yes, it has links to their social, but it also has in a perfect world, it has a video of them talking about themselves and what they do. It has links to all the blogs they've authored on that page. You know, any other content that they've been involved in creating, any certifications they hold, like this is the kitchen sink about that person. If part of your strategy is to get your subject matter experts out speaking at conferences, you should have downloadable headshots. You might even have like abstracts of common topics they talk about. This is your place to really showcase why these people are amazing. And often when websites are built, that you might even have a page like that, but very often the author bio on your blog is something totally different. It is like a little paragraph. So I like to actually build the site so that the author bio and the person's page on the team page are the one and the same so that every time somebody wants to see anything about that person, they're going back to that single source of truth and it's incredibly robust. Uh, because it is, you're, you're spot on. It's so important to establish, you know, expertise and authority, et cetera. And, and Google will see that, but, but people see it, you know, having worked in an agency for 11 years, I got to see a lot of different companies, Google analytics, and 
you know, you get under the hood and you kick the tires. And in almost every single case, one of the most trafficked pages on a company's website is the team page. And that's because people want to know who works for your company. Mm. Your prospects want to know, your customers want to know, like people are looking at the people. So you better have a really good section on your people. <laughs> Can you tell I'm passionate about this? I could go on. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, it very much reinforces that concept that SEO, um, so Google has gotten more and more sophisticated over time. And what Google is doing is trying to establish authority. And based on authority, then thereby rank everything that's associated with, with that authority. Um, and so it's both on the, on the content side, on the subject matter side, but it's also on, well, who is it that is generating that, you know, that content? And so, you know, your observation that you can't just as a second afterthought put you know, bio pages out there and, and think that that's sufficient really gets to this um, thing that you said earlier, which is don't generate a ton of content, focus on the quality of the content because you're, you're building this authority and trust over time. Yeah, absolutely. So you're at a startup now. So I don't know, you might be the PR team, but I'm <laughs> kind of curious um, the process behind you getting closer to PR, because if you've got a new website or a new brand, obviously you need to build up the authority of the company and a footprint online. So I'm just kind of curious whether you have a standard process for doing that. Ah, uh, PR. <laughs> I am not a <laughs> PR expert. <laughs> I should say from the beginning, I, that is a totally, to me, it's like a totally different domain than marketing. And the people who are great at PR are great at PR. And the people that are marketing are great at marketing. So it's very interesting. Right now, I don't have a huge PR budget. My, the company I was at immediately prior to this, I did. So I worked with a PR company. We had them on retainer. It was a much more programmatic approach. Um, so I've done it both ways. And I think if you can afford to hire a great PR person, that there's a time and a place for that. The one thing I will say is I strongly believe you, you need to have a story. It can't just be like, hey, here's our company. We sell this cool thing. Like you have to have something to give to reporters for them to want to report on. So don't spend a lot of money on PR unless you have a story to really pitch. But if you do and you can afford it, absolutely do it. If you do not have a big PR budget, there are a couple of things that I always do that seem to help with what you're getting at, which is really like PR for SEO almost. And one of my favorites is, and, and maybe I'm biased because I have a podcast, but I actually hire podcast booking agents. There are some specialized companies out there that for a very reasonable price will get one of your subject matter experts uh, as a guest on podcasts. Podcasts can provide awesome backlinks um, mm -hmm. and also give wow. you content to share on social. Like, hey, here's an interview I did on this topic. So there are some really great specialized agencies out there, um, or you can use an actual PR company. Look at pricing, I would say. Some of the, P the podcast bookers are pretty reasonable because that's all they do and they have it really down to a science. Um, but that's one of my favorite little like insider tricks for getting good backlinks. That and, and subscribe to help a reporter out, um, Haro. You get an email a couple times a day and it's all just leads of reporters looking for sources for stories. And it's totally hit or miss. You, know? You're, you, you can spend a lot of time pitching them um, I've had mixed success with it, but, you know, using Haro, I've gotten placed in, you know, Inc. Magazine and American Express small business uh, articles and other big journals, as well as much more specialized ones. So those are two kind of scrappy, low budget ways of getting some good backlinks. Yeah, I've actually been placed by Haro. So I've, I, I respond very intermittently, but when yeah. I'm a little bit slower, I sort of start lurking and I've gotten coverage in it. Yeah, it can be exhausting to get yeah. three Haro emails a day. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Someone needs to build a tool that just <laughs> scrapes Haro for keywords and sends you the things that like matter the most. <laughs> right. There's a business <laughs> there. <laughs> <laughs> so one, um, one question that uh, you, you have this great opportunity because you've been both inside an agency and outside as people begin building, um, you know, and working for companies, as people begin building their marketing efforts, um, more and more, there's such a broad band of different skill sets. Can you talk to how to balance what you do internally versus what you hire as services and where the industry is going in terms of marketing as a service kind of concept? Yeah. One of the reasons I got out of the agency business is that 
you know, when I first started, content marketing was still pretty new uh, and novel. It's become very mainstream. And I think that's good and bad. It's good that people re recognize that content is really powerful, but it's bad because there's this just glut of horrible content coming out. And a lot of that is because people hire agencies and just sort of take this check the box approach to, well, I got to publish a blog a week. And so whatever, it's a blog, put it up. I, like, you know, I said earlier, content is so quality is so important. And so I think one of the first positions that I would hire for, honestly, as a content manager to just come in and amp up the volume of really good content, somebody who can write and do those interviews and, you know, write, not just write articles for your website, but write website page content, pillar content, guest articles for other websites like that. If you have a great volume of that, there's a lot you can do. Um, now that presupposes that you as the person hiring them are, are a marketer who's a little bit of a Swiss army knife. Um, and I talked to somebody on my podcast recently about this, your first marketing hire for the company. If you're the CEO, you need to look for somebody who is like a human Swiss army knife who can do a lot of different things because, and, and I'm like the only marketer in my company right now. I have somebody who helps two days a week and some agency support. And thank God I've had enough experience over the years where not only can I build a strategy, but I can get in and build a landing page and, you know, tweak the copy on a website page and write the emails and set up the drip campaigns. Like I got to be able to roll my sleeves up and do it. But, you know, after somebody like me, I think somebody who can really write and produce a lot of volume is important. I like having a writer on staff too, because you really want to, to have content that sounds consistently like it's coming from your company and to capture that authenticity. And I think building up that voice over time, you can do it really well if you have an internal writer. Um, the things that I would outsource, you know, and it changes over time. In the early days, you're going to outsource a lot because you kind of have to, you can't afford to hire everybody. But as you go, you get further along, outsourcing really specialized roles. Like for example, I generally tend to outsource technical SEO. It's very specialized. Most companies, until they're much bigger, don't need a full-time technical SEO on their team. I also have outsourced paid ads. Again, it's very, very specialized and you, you don't want to screw it up because it, it can be a lot of money down the tubes if you do. Uh, eventually, if you're spending a lot of money and seeing a lot of success with paid ads, you could hire that position on your team. But that tends to be something that I've outsourced a lot. PR, we talked about that already. Mm -hmm. um, you know, And then it just really depends on on how much work you have to, to get done. I think if you, I always look at it as like, if I have enough work that it could be done by a full-time in-house person, I, I would rather hire that person and have them on my team than pay outsourced. And, you know, and I had an agency, but I, but let's be honest, right. agent, you're, it's going to be more expensive to pay an agency than it is to hire somebody full-time. So you have to think strategically about what you're outsourcing. So the first two hires are Swiss army knife <laughs> and then somebody who can write. Yeah. And, and really me, manage the content funnel, right? Um, yeah. Because so much content is necessary and it really needs to have a consistent voice and tone and it needs to come from internally, you know, generated under understanding of the product, the, the market and uh, the people of the company, right? Absolutely. Okay. That's, that's really good advice. So um, we're kind of coming to the end. Uh, we have, we have some fun questions that we would love to ask. And actually um, uh, since uh, Catherine is, is more of a fun person than I am in this moment, <laughs> <No>. <laughs> I'm going to turn the questions over to her. <laughs> well, so, I mean, you've shared a bunch of moments of how to get to that win because this is the digital marketing victories podcast but is there a, an additional resource or win that you want people to walk away with that you think would be really helpful as they're either launching their marketing career or you know picking up their first director of marketing position Ooh, um i you know i think finding a the biggest challenge that i've heard marketers talk about is that they're overwhelmed you know, digital marketing changes really, really quickly. And it's like drinking from a fire hose. And I think you could come into a position like that and very quickly feel totally overwhelmed. So finding a couple of resources that are really good for learning and just sticking with those is important. I'll give a little plug to a company that I used to work at called Impact. They're a phenomenal learning resource. They produce tons and tons of content. It's like four or five articles a day 
all for marketers. They have an amazing newsletter written by an unbelievable writer, which the newsletter itself is full of great information. It's called The Latest, but the woman who writes it, Liz Moorhead, is, is probably just somebody you should follow if you want to see what really amazing writing looks like, uh, marketing writing. She's an incredible example. So that's one resource. Um, and, and they actually still publish my podcast. So I take that for what it's worth. That might be a little self-serving, but, um, but it's because they, they produce great content and they have a huge audience and a lot of followers and it's, it's, it's good stuff. And then beyond that, I, I love podcasts. I would say find a couple of really good podcasts that, that speak to you and stick with those, but don't try to, don't try to read everything and consume everything. It's too much. Find a few people that are good follow them and rely on them for learning. That's, that's honestly my best piece of advice. Well, and it gets, it gets back to what you said earlier, which is just get in the habit of doing. Yeah. And I think as you get in the habit of doing, what happens is, okay, I've got to get better at this. You start reaching out and you find, find resources based on that and you stay focused on the next doing. Yeah. And I think that 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 really helps you develop that habit. Um, but but I do want to I do want to put you on the spot. Is there a recent win that you've had either internally or that, that you want to kind of share um, personal or otherwise? Well, I mean, I'm, I'm only a month in. So, <laughs> yeah, um, I would say my biggest win is within a month uh, getting getting I, I put marketing automation in place. We didn't have anything. So I I got HubSpot. I got it all set up. I built my first few landing pages. I sent out our first email newsletter and put in place our first workflows. Um, I recently turned on an ad campaign and I'm, I'm now seeing all of that work bear fruit because the ad goes back to the landing page I built, which kicks off the, the email nurturing flow and, and to see people converting and to know that that's turning into leads. That's such a good feeling because that's, yeah. you know, that's the start of what a lot more needs to follow that, but it's nice to within a month at least start to see some results. <laughs> Yay! That's, that's a that's, great that's yeah. a great amount of um, output in a month. That's uh, that's amazing. Thank yeah. you. I'm very yeah. happy that it all got done. <laughs> yeah, congratulations. <laughs> all right. So, how can people learn more about you? So the you certainly can uh, Google the Inbound Success Podcast. I publish that um, every single Monday at 11.30 in the morning. I'm on episode 133 right now. By the time this goes live, it'll be probably around episode 150. And uh, you'll learn a lot about me through that. But also I'm very active on LinkedIn and I will connect with you if you reach out to me. And also currently I'm, I'm kind of rejuvenating my activity on Twitter. I'm really enjoying Twitter lately. So you can find me at work, mommy work, just sort of wow. my life in a nutshell. <laughs> um, so those are, those are really the best channels. And, and then if you're interested in, in connecting with me through my current company, that's Attila Security, which is attilasec.com. So from my perspective, Kathleen, your win would be the podcast. <laughs> the fact that you're, that <laughs> you're I'm keeping, still doing it 130 you know. episodes later. Oh my gosh. I know. Yeah. I can't stop now. <laughs> even if I want to, I'm like too deep. <laughs> that's, that's impressive to me. <laughs> and it's you can fun. see where that momentum leads you to the success that you have in such a short period of time with your new company, right? Is it, again, it comes back to that. Just get up and do it every day. Yeah, it's fun. I love podcasting. I love learning from other marketers. So hopefully I'm able to share that with other people through the podcast. Great. Well, thank you very much. This has been fantastic. Thank you yeah. for having me. It was thank so much you. fun. Thanks so much for listening. To find out more about our podcast and what we are up to, go to digitalmarketingvictories.com. Subscribe to us on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. And please, if you like what you hear, spread the word. Rate us, comment, and share. We're always looking for new topics, ideas, and guests. So if you have suggestions, please go to our website or email us at questions at digitalmarketingvictories.com. And thanks for listening.